I'm really happy to be able to uh, introduce Sydney Scott better. Um, I am going to, uh, you know, I have the usual formal blurb here written out, but, um, but I just want to say that Sydney wandered into the studio, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and uh, just with some guy who was asking really interesting questions uh, about dance and 3D printing and all sorts of uh, interesting combinations and, of topics, and he was really enthusiastic and a fascinating person, and I subsequently found out um, who he was, and now I have a blurb that tells me more ID. stuff. And, <laughs> it's like, uh, I work here. So, so the, gradually our relationship has been growing a little bit uh, over time, and uh, we're so happy to have him here as a speaker to talk about his work. Um, so I'm going to enter into the formal stuff. Um, he is here at a, as a public humanities fellow and lecturer at Brown. Uh, he researches the problematics of human computer interfaces and mixed reality systems. Um, primarily, he is a choreographer. Uh, he got his MFA from chore you know, choreography from New York University. Um, he's been featured <laughs> by Dance Magazine as one of the most influential people in dance today. And, uh, there you, go. You, you can clap, that's fine. <laughs> that's, um, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Signing autographs at the back of the room yeah. at the end. Um, and his work has been performed around the country by such venues as the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the Boston Center for the Arts, Jacob's Pillow, and the Joyce Theater. And has consulted on issues of cultural change and technology for the National Ballet of Canada. I'm on Canadian. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Jerome Fott, the Robbins Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Hasbro, and New York University and the University of Southern California. And he is the founder of the Conference for Research on Choreographic Interfaces, wow. <laughs> which uh, convenes ethnographers, anthropologists, speculative uh, designers, and performing artists to discuss the choreography of the Internet of Things. And so, um, Sydney's got a bit. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Um, and, and first and foremost, uh, thank you so much, Patrick, and, uh, and, and uh, everyone for bringing me out here. It's immensely appreciated and I'm uh, grateful despite having so many of you in the room to disappoint. Um, so uh, I guess really quickly, um, I'm Sydney and thank you for that int introduction and I'm a choreographer and um, I guess part of my job uh, here at Brown and as a choreographer is to kind of continuously be defining and redefining what that word choreographer means. Um, but I, I want to put uh, this conversation uh, today in a particular context. Um, last week, uh, the Supreme Court heard uh, oral arguments in the case of uh, Carpenter versus the United States. You guys are familiar with this? Um, back in, um, it was 2011, uh, a group of uh, four men were arrested for a string of uh, armed robberies of radio shacks across Michigan. And uh, in addition to uh, eyewitness accounts that placed these uh, individuals at the scene, uh, actually conducting the, the robbery, um, the thing that actually put them in jail uh, was uh, data procured from Verizon. Um, what the, uh, the, the state did was they uh, procured uh, cell phone triangulation data, which uh, corroborated the eyewitness accounts saying that the men were where they were supposed to be, or supposedly uh, being, robbing radio shacks. Um, but uh, the, the case that's now before the Supreme Court goes something like this. Um, the, the, st the United States is arguing um, that uh, the government should be able to, at any time, be, uh, monitor um, past and present location data of anybody with a cell phone in this country. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna like let that like land for a second. <laughs> yeah, so the government is saying that by dint of your owning a cell phone, you are opting in to omnipresent surveillance. Yeah, at any time, for any reason, extrajudicially. Yeah? Maybe. <laughs> On the other hand, folks like the ACLU, um, nerds around the country, and actually Verizon itself uh, is arguing that no, that's bonker balls, and, and we need judicial review, and you need to have things like subpoenas. The government can't just like see where all of us are at any given moment, not only now, but any time in time. Yeah. Um, so th this is a, a court case that is, is happening literally right now, um, and will probably be finished around, uh, around June. But I, I bring this up now um, to gesture to the importance of things like movement. Um, and how movement through time signifies, how it creates meaning. Um, because we're at, we're at a, a queer moment where uh, you know, how our movement creates meaning is being radically recontextualized. We have many more uh, media 
uh, capturing movement data than ever before, ever in history, ever and ever and ever, right? Um, but what we don't have is control over the meanings created by that data and by whom. These are the stakes, right? This is not uh, just about choreography as conventionally uh, understood, understood, certainly as I was trained. Um, what I'm thinking about is how movement creates meaning over time, whether you're on a stage or not. Yeah. Um, so since I've, I've sort of soured the mood, I want to show you a YouTube clip. Um, uh, this is uh, me as a, a nine-year-old dancing to a chorus line. Please hold your laughter <laughs> until the end, or laugh perpetually. <laughs> So note, this is uh, sort of repetitious without being repeating. Uh, a lot of really complex sort of formal dynamics at play. I also seem to have a black eye. <laughs> a, little, a little unclear where that came from. May or may not be wearing capri pants. How long have you been dancing with that Well, I'm nine years old in the video, so about nine years. <laughs> yeah. Um, You know, we'll stop this <laughs> you know, at, at the very end, you, you can Google this and you can see me. Thank you. Thank you for clapping. Thank you. You know, it was taking a while for you guys to applaud me again. And I was like, come on, guys. We're all in this together for me. Um, uh, if you want to, this is more on YouTube. There's a, me singing very earnestly. It's just like, I hope I get it. Oh, but like I'm nine and it's hilarious. Anyway, um, so uh, this is a particular moment uh, early in, in my dance training. I'd taken a couple dance classes clearly, um, had an interest in improvisation, um, and also self-seriousness. Um, as a, a choreographer, I, I took that material um, to create a, a new dance. Uh, in uh, 2011, uh, there was a world premiere at the Joyce Theater in New York City. Um, and, and what I did was I uh, instructed uh, and uh, collaborated with my dancers at the time. This is uh, Jennifer Jones and Jordan Isidore. Um, what we did was we reconstructed that chorus line video, um, but with elite, highly trained professional dancers. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, uh, this is a, a clip from one of our first rehearsals, relearning and animating that material. A five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> We had not yet set it to music yet. Um, but in the, in the absence of the context of my living room, um, you can see some kind of uh, pretty sophisticated uh, movement patterning right there. So like there's a lot of, uh, sort of play on, on uh, vectoring changes of weight. Um, this is a very difficult movement phrase. I don't know if that's obvious, but um, my dancers disliked me actively for a, <laughs> a kind of a, a long time um, after this um, and during this and then before it also. Um, yeah, amazing, amazing, right? Um, so uh, what we then did with that kind of base phrase uh, was we uh, kaleidoscopically processed it through a variety of choreographic mechanisms, right? So there was a lot of mirroring, there was a lot of retrograde action. There's basically uh, everything you could throw uh, a dancerly phrase. We uh, threw the choreo book at it. That was a very mixed metaphor, but you know what I mean. Um, and, and so what I'd like to show you now is uh, the, f the final result, or at least a clip of the final result. This is the, uh, the work as it premiered in New York in 2011. So this music is by Johan Johansson. Um, the dancers are Gary Schofeld, Jordan Isidore, Kristen Bell, and Jennifer Jones. Um, this is the chorus line phrase. Reanimated, crucible. But this is it. Thank you. 
Um, the, th the whole thing is also on YouTube and on Vimeo if you'd like to take a, a longer uh, look. Um, what, what I hope to indicate by showing this is, is just the, the kind of um, the jewel box way that we I took, that we took, and this was a highly collaborative venture because I sure as hell couldn't remember all of this choreography and then do all the math to it. Um, we, we took this intimate gesture, this tiny kind of farcical moment from my childhood and then did a bunch of stuff to it. Uh, we processed it um, to create this dance for consumption and interpretation by our audiences. Now, a very reasonable question um, that I assume some of you are, are thinking that I, I certainly face on a, a fairly ongoing uh, basis is uh, something to the effect of, Sydney, you're a choreographer. Why are you thinking so much about surveillance? You're a choreographer. Why do you think so much about the Internet of Things? Why do you do this stuff with the technology? And, and I don't have an easy answer for that, um, except to say it, it strikes me that there's a very similar kind of, of patterning um, between my taking an intimate gesture uh, from a past moment, processing it, and then performing it for an audience, and what the Internet of Things is doing to us on a daily basis, taking our most intimate moments, our most intimate gestures, our microfacial expressions, uh, tiny fluctuations in our heart rate, core temperature, our movement through space and time, processing it with the help of algorithms and AI, and then putting it out for display for an audience of machines and software. What I'm interested in is the interpretive moment, the way that our bodies perform. Um, I think this is a, a nascent moment uh, for choreography. I think this is a moment where what we understand to be choreography is radically changing. Uh, and while I don't have a whole lot of answers uh, for what it is or what it will be, uh, this is the scope of my research at this moment. But I, I also wanted to sort of own with humility what that means, right? It means that I'm an expert in choreography. I'm an expert in how people move through space, predominantly on a stage. Uh, but I, I wonder what the stages of the future look like. So I want to, um, if we can pause this for a moment, I want to uh, go to a, another um, kind of crucial moment in, in my, uh, I was emphatic, crucial moment, um, sort of a Seinfeldian um, heart palpitation there. Um, the movie Minority Report. You guys seen Minority Report? Yeah. So this is, <laughs> thank you. Um, so th this is kind of an important, let's just call it a, a, a text, right? So this is, um, you know, part, part of this work and research has been to identify films, books, uh, sort of cultural artifacts um, that also deal with the, the problematics of how bodies, human bodies and machines interact uh, and interface, literally. Um, and Minority Pro Report, uh, as Bonker balls flawed and frequently racist as the film is, um, it provides a useful kind of way of imagining um, a literally gestural interface uh, between uh, humans and computers. So on that note, let's take a look. This is an edited clip um, from the 2002 Steven Spielberg uh, opus, Minority Report. This is uh, Tom Cruise's muscles. <laughs> Under license registration. She might control that. I should note there is a uh, slur at the end of this phrase. Or, uh, Can you grab that? It's okay. I've got six licenses. Where do you want? Over here, please. This is my favorite part in the entire film where they have this crazy advanced interface thing and then they use hard media to transfer between apparently unnetworked computers. <laughs> like, ah, uh, yes, I'll take the glass pane. Okay, great. So note again the repetitious but non-repeating hand gestures done by um, Tom Cruise. Central perimeter and tunnel on road to get into the fence here. Yeah, it's a twink from the Fed poking around right now. Found the roads out of your calendar. I left you a message at your house. Take it with the papers ahead of Florida. See if the neighbors knew where they went. Check all the relations. Check the neighbors and relations. Oh, John. Thanks. Just get us a call. Tell some stories how I save your ass every day. Can't be without me. Hey, I'll call you. Thank you. Danny with me. Twink from the Fed. Oops. Go. Sorry, Danny. I'm going to have to give you the full course. Of the the marks have been a couple of weeks ago. Nobody knows where. Still searching for family and employees. Time horizon 12 counts. 
Uh, what is doing we, can, the we, can, we can go ahead and pause there. Uh, um, that's the perfect frame to pause <laughs> on. It's like Tom Cruise looking seriously through glass. Um, so uh, the, it's funny. Minority Report is one of my favorite films for lots of reasons, not the least of which is because the gulf between like the film that I remember and the film itself, <laughs> it, it's just huge, right? Um, so a couple things. Uh, I, I want to tell you a little bit about um, kind of the, the choreographic history of, of this technology. Um, you guys uh, ever heard of a guy named uh, John Underkoffler? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, put those hands up. <laughs> right. Um, so John Underkoffler um, is a nerd. Uh, and he, um, at the time of uh, the pre-production for this film, he was a recent graduate and professor at uh, the MIT Media Lab doing research on uh, emerging... Uh, human computer interfaces, gestural interfaces specifically. Um, so he was tapped uh, by Spielberg and the design team of Minority Report to take his extant research and Hollywoodize it um, for the sake of the Tom Cruise experience, right? Um, so I, I want to uh, say this again. Uh, this was uh, extant research back in 2000, 2001 um, uh, on uh, gestural interfaces between computers and human beings um, that uh, this guy, John Underkoffler, transformed uh, with the help of his design team into this crazy mega. Um, then uh, on the basis of the success of, of this film, and I'm, I'm simplifying the timeline just a little bit, uh, Underkoffler then went on to work on the Iron Man franchise, uh, doing similar uh, holographic display, uh, speculative display stuff, uh, among other films. Um, and then he took the kind of intellectual capital uh, and certainly cultural heft of this work and started a company. That company is called Oblong. Um, it is a uh, for-profit enterprise based in Los Angeles um, that specializes in, wait for it, collaborative software and hardware with gestural controls. Um, this technology, admittedly with some changes, has gone from uh, lab toys to science fiction to science fact. This technology, admittedly without Tom Cruise, uh, or maybe he's in there somewhere, I'm a little unclear, uh, <laughs> it exists. Uh, this stuff is real. The oblong uh, technology is called mezzanine, which is, an, I think, an appropriately sort of theatrical uh, metaphor. Um, it's a primary, uh, the primary clients uh, of this uh, company are maybe not uh, surprisingly, given the uh, dystopic um, valences of Minority Report, the Department of Defense and Energy Companies. Go figure. Um, all to say that the choreographics of this film have an afterlife, uh, and uh, I think, a, a, or not even an afterlife, because they're still living, they're still here and present, uh, and they affect uh, the decision-making um, of uh, terrifying people every day. Um, but the, the other thing uh, that, finds me, that I find really striking about this, um, this film, um, you know, as, as somebody who professionally has, has sort of watched uh, gestural controls uh, emerge and um, it exist over the last uh, however many years, uh, the funny thing to me about this this, uh, this uh, clip, this uh, film, is that the gestural controls seem to work. Full stop. The, the, stuff, the technology works in this film, and in the world, they do not, right? So uh, in the real world, there is, uh, several of my students are in the back not, nodding, like, oh my god, it's so true. Uh, none of this stuff works. Um, I mean, it, I, I'm exaggerating slightly, but the, the, the reality is, of course, that gestural controls are, for many reasons, much, 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 much more uh, difficult than certainly this um, represents. Um, but back in 2002 or what have you, I, I started getting interested in how this technology fails. And it fails frequently. It fails often. It fails in fantastical ways. Um, so one of my favorite uh, examples of, of the failure, specifically of, of gestural uh, technology, um, a couple of you have heard this anecdote before, I'm sure. Um, the Nest smoke alarm. Yeah, a couple nods. Yeah. Uh, again, my student's nodding. I'm so sorry. You're going to hear a lot of stuff that you've already heard. Um, the Nest smoke alarm. So, so the Nest, uh, Nest is a company currently owned by Google. It's founded by a bunch of Apple nerds, um, ex-Apple nerds. Uh, and, and their uh, sort of big uh, sort of genius moment was to take all of these kind of boring, uh, frequently poorly working uh, bits of, of uh, 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 hardware that are in all of our homes and then make them smart. Um, so for example, thermostats. Um, a lever, a single lever um, is, is, is too dumb. Uh, we need to make it smart by injecting software into it, and that software will track your every movement and become smart. Um, for example, uh, so the Nest thermostat is maybe the most sort of popular or popularized 
uh, bit of hardware that comes out of the Nest um, uh, entity. Um, but a couple years ago, they came out with something called the Nest Smoke Alarm, or Nest Protect. Um, and, and one of the uh, sort of supposed advantages of the Nest Smoke Alarm was, wait for it, a gestural control system. Let's see where this is going. I wonder if this will work well. Maybe it will not. Um, so what, one of the uh, ideas was, okay, like you're, you're cooking something and there's smoke maybe and the smoke alarm goes off and what do you do when a smoke alarm goes off in your house? You punch the smoke alarm to death until it stops, right? Not a very good user interface. It's a functional user interface system, but maybe not a desirable one. Um, so what, what Nest uh, did was they said, okay, look, we, um, within a, a reasonable uh, amount of doubt, can understand when there's a body in front of the smoke alarm, and we can understand uh, that there are hands. Uh, we have sensors that know what hands are, um, and when they move like this, this is a gesture. This is a gesture that the smoke alarm can discern, and when the smoke alarm sees this gesture, the smoke alarm is going to shut itself off. Yeah, so it goes like something like this. Like you're cooking something smoky, the smoke alarm uh, goes off, and instead of punching the smoke alarm to death, you just stand in front of it and go, we're, we're all good. <laughs> and then the smoke alarm goes, ah, yes, of course, uh, and turns itself off. Um, in practice, however, it turned out that the smoke alarm was functionally and fundamentally unable to register the difference between a gesture that says, everything's cool, and a gesture that says, I am literally on fire. <laughs> and this functionality had to be turned off with the apologies of the CEO uh, of Nest. Um, and I, I want to I read this verbatim, because um, the, the, the release uh, and a sort of vague apology from Nest is, is maybe uh, instructive here. Um, I'm quoting from coverage um, back in, I think, 20, would have been 12 or 13. Um, from Nest, quote, according to a Nest spokesperson, the error actually lies in Nest Protect's potentially interpreting various other movements as a command to go silent. Silent. Nest is not commenting on what those particular movements are, but does describe them as a, quote, unique combination of circumstances. Choreography. <laughs> yeah. So built in to the, the software of the Nest is some kind of cryptic choreography that nobody outside the company can know that apparently causes that shit to lose its mind. <laughs> so this, this to me represents a pretty profound choreographic failure, right? Where there is a supposedly simple hand gesture that uh, derailed the functionality of, of this uh, consumer device. Thankfully, nobody di like died. Uh, but it's not a coincidence that this functionality has not been built into every successive generation of Nest uh, since. The functionality is gone. It's too risky. They can't take it. Um, what's next? Let me see. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, so this, this brings me to um, some other sort of unintended uh, ways that uh, technologies uh, understand our movements or misunderstand our movements. Um, so one, one of my, um, I don't know, I, I feel like talking about how our cell phones track our bodies is almost passe at this point, but we have to keep talking about it because they're not going to stop tracking us. Um, Uber. You guys heard of Uber? <laughs> Let me take that one to the camera. <laughs> um, so a kind of uh, malevolent company, just like generally, um, and we know that on all sorts of levels now, um, of course, because of litigation. Um, but there, was, there were signs. There were signs dating many years ago that the company um, didn't particularly care or was not particularly interested in the privacy and safety of its users. Uh, one such example of many possible uh, was a blog post dating back from, I think, 2013, titled, wait for it, Rides of Glory. Um, what, what Uber's data scientists did uh, and why they thought to publish this, I will never know. Um, they uh, decided that uh, they would set aside a team that would uh, do uh, you know, data science-y stuff um, on user data, on rider data. And th this is a fairly standard practice across um, all software companies forever, right? Um, but what Uber did was they, they uh, made a couple guesses. Um, oh, by the way, this next uh, section of my talk acknowledges the existence of sex. Um, FYI, it's a thing. Um, so uh, what, what Uber did was it, it uh, used data science to determine that when individuals were taking Uber cars or Uber taxis um, to a place that wasn't their home between the hours of, I think it was like 11 p.m. and 4 a.m., they take a car to a place that isn't their home, and then within a margin of a certain number of hours goes to a place that is their home, 
they have just had sexual intercourse. They have just had, a, in their, their phrase, a, a, I think a, a ride of glory, a one night stand. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I just want to sort of talk that through for a moment. Um, what Uber was doing was using data science on your data to make an educated guess, a highly educated guess, as to whether or not you were having sex. There is not nearly enough awkward laughter in this room, I know, right? you know what I mean, right? So, um, and not just when you were having sex, but where, and potentially with whom. And why did they want this data? That is an excellent question for a team of very well-paid lawyers. <laughs> it says something about Uber's corporate culture, to say the least, yeah. Um, this is another example of how our movement as crucible through math, as crucible through data science, can be made legible in all sorts of ways that we are not intending or cognizant of. Yeah. Um, one, one more quick example of this. Um, uh, the, uh, the Snowden leaks um, back in, I think it was, this was also, what, 2014, 15, maybe? Um, what, one of the uh, many things that were revealed uh, in the Snowden leaks um, were some of the exact uh, means by which uh, the NSA tracks individuals using cell phone data. Yeah, uh, and one of the most interesting parts of, of, of that um, for me was a specific tactic um, called, it's like called co-partnering, um, or uh, let me make sure I have these notes, one sec. Uh, co-traveler, the co-traveler phenomenon. And what, what this was was, may I, may I use this whiteboard? Is that allowed? Uh, it's old school, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, so, uh, hearkening back to Carpenter versus United States, here we have the NSA, right? So let, let's go ahead and say that these are overlapping uh, cell tower um, configurations, right? So each one of these represents um, the uh, sort of radius of a cell tower, um, and using um, uh, triangulation between these cell towers, uh, the NSA and or Verizon or Apple or Google or whoever uh, is able to understand uh, to a, a margin of a couple tenths of a meter where you are in physical space at any given time, right? Um, so let, let's go ahead and say that you are a person of interest, heaven help you, uh, of the national, uh, the NSA, right? So let's say that uh, you're, uh, it doesn't really matter where this is, but let's say you have a path through space that looks something like this, yeah? Um, you, you start here and over the course of an hour or whatever you end up here, going through these cell tower coverage areas uh, as you do. Now, um, the co-partnering uh, or the fellow traveler uh, phenomenon basically says that there will be other people, most of them random, who also are in these cell towers at the time uh, that you pass through them, yeah? Um, but some of these people will move alongside you as you go. So for example, let's say that this is a, you, you are a personal, person of interest and this person happens to traverse uh, these um, cell tower uh, arrangements as you are moving through space uh, and time. And then let's say you're, you go through three of these things and then you kind of beg off over here. Um, what that does, um, given enough data uh, on the part of the NSA or whomever, uh, suggests that you, um, this person here, are also a person of interest because you have co-traveled with the other originating person of interest over a certain duration of time across a certain, dura uh, certain amount of space, right? Um, so using uh, computer science and um, essentially a time machine of data uh, on the basis of who is traveling through space with whom, they're able to create a list of, of potential associates of a person of interest. Um, so that's creepy enough because um, most of the time these patterns are completely random. Um, but sometimes, uh, for, for example, you guys are, all, have you ever heard of Facebook? Yes, we heard, yeah, okay, fine. Um, there's two billion people on Facebook, right? Um, and and one, uh, a question that is posed of the company with some frequency is, is how does the, uh, the friend recommendation engine work? Like, how does that work? Why is this person I met at a bar all of a sudden a recommended friend uh, on my Facebook feed or whatever? Uh, it turns out that this co-traveler phenomena is part of the math that informs Facebook's algorithm. Now, this is something that they said that they do and then they said that they don't do, so I leave it to your judgment as to whether they do it or not. Um, but to say that one more time, Facebook, a uh, transnational mega corporation, uses uh, the same kind of geographic parameters uh, and geospatial parameters as the NSA to figure out who you should be friends with. Yeah? Um, so, you know, maybe, F the, uh, maybe Facebook isn't like 
uh, quite as malevolently faceless as the NSA, or maybe they are, I don't really know, but the math is the same. Yeah, that's all I know. Um, and you can, you can imagine uh, any number of circumstances where this kind of geospatial placement um, can be used for um, things more nefarious than friend requests. Yeah. Um, you, you can also imagine um, just how uh, the state was able to work backwards to figure out whether um, Tim Carpenter was at a radio shack or not. You can also see this data being readily used to see if you were at synagogue or not, or at temple, um, or uh, at a Planned Parenthood, or anywhere at all. Yeah. Um, so, fantastic. Um, I, I guess this is all a little dark. Um, I, I guess something I, I want to sort of return to is the kind of humility that I, I personally feel and face as a choreographer uh, making maps like I'm not a computer scientist, right? I, I'm not, this is not my expertise. Um, and yet this work requires that I seek out and partner with folks who do have expertise in computer science, among other uh, fields, so as to continue this conversation, so as to continue learning. Um, going back, uh, back to, let's see, it would have been 20, da, 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 2014. Um, right around when the Apple Watch was first coming out and the uh, sensor array that we were uh, sort of placing on our, our bodies um, that could tell things like, of course, blood oxygen level uh, and, and heart rate, um, but also the, the Apple Watch could read hand gestures. Um, this uh, moment uh, it, by, from a mass market company in attempting to read our bodies um, was uh, astonishing to me. And as a choreographer, I, I wondered what was possible um, given that potentially millions, if not literally billions of people uh, would be wearing uh, similar body sensing uh, material. Um, back in 2013, um, I, I won a, a Rhode Island State Council for the Arts Choreographic Fellowship. Um, and somewhat without their permission, sorry, um, I used some of that, uh, that money to buy tequila, which I gave to nerds to talk about these issues. Um, I brought um, a number of uh, experts from um, the Brown uh, Providence uh, area, but also some nerds from Los Angeles and New York. Uh, folks, uh, artists, computer scientists, ethnographers, uh, designers, people who um, have a much deeper stack of knowledge on these problematics than I do. And, and the question that we debated uh, and, and uh, discussed was something like this. Um, gestural controls and body sensing human computer interfaces seems like a giant, bleep this, clusterfuck. It seems like a giant uh, mess of um, uh, ethical uh, problematics. Uh, it seems bonkers racist, bonkers sexist, bonkers ableist, um, and we're just getting started. Like this is the advent of a new field of technology uh, that is just now gaining mass market traction. It seems like an awful lot could go at awfully wrong. My question to this group of nerds uh, was, A, am I right in supposing that this seems as potentially terrible as it seems? Uh, and also, is choreography a potentially useful method or metaphor? Uh, in rocking some of these questions. Is thinking about movement um, and the passage of time uh, and generation of meaning a useful way of framing some of these conversations? Um, and there's a lot about this particular gaggle I don't remember because tequila. But what I do remember <laughs> was feeling affirmed um, that, there, that the expertise to deal with these questions is radically distributed. Um, and that expertise uh, in, uh, uh, there is no one who is uniquely qualified or uh, exhaustively qualified to uh, deal with these questions. Um, and that's humbling. That's humbling. Um, and to deal with that, uh, that distribution of knowledge, um, I set out to start, of all things, an academic conference. Sorry. Um, so uh, we're park in working wor uh, with the Brown Arts Initiative, then the CAC, uh, Kira Del Sesto um, at the Granoff Center, um, we started this thing called the Conference for Research on Choreographic Interfaces, or CIRCE. Um, which is also the witch from the Odyssey for those of you who went to Columbia University. Um, and it's sort of a joke, but it's not funny. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that, that was an affirmation of yes, that is not funny. Thank you, yes. Um, but I mean, there, there is something sort of magical about this, uh, magical and maybe uh, sort of nefarious about it. Um, in any event, this, this nerd gaggle um, is something that I, I now produce um, annually um, at the Granoff Center. And, and what it is, is a, a massively uh, inclusive and incredibly heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous group uh, of nerds talking about all different facets of this crazy making. Um, it's uh, about bringing in the people who, uh, in many cases, design uh, the software and hardware who actually who make this stuff real, um, but also the people who critique it, 
um, who, uh, who uh, explain it, who teach it. Um, it is, there's a lot of barbecue, and there is some amount of tequila, not as much as in, in the uh, old days. Um, but the assumption is that uh, we have to gather uh, a diff different groups of people together uh, to deal with these kinds of questions, certainly than I've ever uh, gathered together as a dancer or choreographer. Um, one of my favorite parts about Circe, though, um, in addition to the camaraderie and the emerging kind of social and professional um, circuitry that's developing, is that I get to commission art. Uh, and I, I want to, um, th this is something I, I try to own uh, on a daily basis, that art is a form of research, right? And, and I think it would, uh, this, is a, this is a responsibility that I take seriously as this conference is, is growing. Um, one, one of my favorite uh, pieces of work that is going to be premiering at CRC in 2018 um, is a collaboration between a roboticist with a background in Laban notation and dance history uh, and a data scientist uh, who is also a choreographer. Um, Katie Kwan and Amy LeBeers. Um, what's going to happen, you should all come. It's going to be great. There's going to be a barbecue and a big-ass hulking robot dancing with a, a tiny woman. It's going to be amazing. Um, and uh, potentially uh, dangerous. Um, but uh, it, it's uh, their, their, their work, their research together, which is both artistic and highly functional, um, is going to be to create this work between a, a, a woman and a big-ass hulking robot. Um, and I have no idea what it will look like. I don't know how it will succeed aesthetically or whatnot, but I, I do know um, that I haven't seen that dance before, and I'm excited uh, to have some part uh, in bringing it uh, to life. Um, I want to uh, sort of end on a, a maybe more personal note. Um, I'll acknowledge that as, as a choreographer coming from sort of proscenial, um, from a from proscenial expertise, from proscenial beginnings, um, I am still figuring out what my creative practice means right now, how it functions right now. Um, I found myself deeply uh, uh, tractored into this exploration, and I, I, I'm concerned and terrified most of the time, um, in general, but also specifically about my artistic career, uh, because I'm not quite sure what it means to make work anymore. I'm not sure what it means to make dances anymore given that the, the ways of capturing our, our body's movements and intentions through time um, are at once so small and so proliferated. Um, something I am beginning to work on, and it's at its most beginning uh, and most nascent stages, um, I've been thinking a lot about drones lately and drone swarms and uh, what it would take uh, for a drone swarm, uh, and I'm talking dozens of potentially hundreds of, of drones to be controlled by my body through choreographic or gestural controls. This also seems uh, like so much uh, of the stuff I've been ranting about today, basically uh, terrifying and probably a huge cluster crap. But um, to, uh, as an artist, I find myself attracted to things that are potentially uh, devastatingly terrible um, and also maybe just a little bit beautiful. Um, as part of that initial research, I've been wondering what governs these drones, especially lots of drones. Like one drone is hard enough to pilot by itself, let alone two, let alone five, let alone dozens. Um, and, and one of the ways that um, I, I've been thinking about that is by partnering with, uh, not surprisingly, partnering with other people, um, specifically uh, nerds in the field of biomimicry. Um, so I'm a, a, a choreograph choreographic research fellow um, at the Biomimicry uh, Institute at the University of Akron. And uh, one of the uh, questions that we are exploring is, uh, and, and mostly them for the moment, is, is how is it that swarms of animals mm -hmm navigate space in massive constellations without clobbering each other all of the time. Um, and this is not something that we have an answer for exactly. This is, uh, this is it, it's not nascent research exactly, but it is uh, unknown, it's uncertain. Um, so for example, this, um, Um, this is uh, one, one of my favorite. This, was a, 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 this is a short film um, that I'm actually hoping to show uh, on campus through uh, CRC uh, in the spring called The Art of Flight. Um, and and what, what it shows is a, a, a swarm, uh, I think they call it a murmuration, a murmuration of starlings. There are uh, thousands of birds here moving in incredible synchrony. Um, and it's, it's both gorgeous and terrifying, which means that I, I should probably pay attention to it. Um, but I, you know, I want to acknowledge also that you know, artists since forever have been fascinated by nature, right? Um, and that, that's its own kind of genre and trope and stereotype maybe. But um, for me as an artist right now, um, given how much of, of my work is so deeply preoccupied with the terror of our emerging technologies,
things like this help me sleep at night. And I want to share it with you now. I highly recommend you check out this website, by the way, um, yannivanjekin.com. Um, so I guess I'm going to shut the crack up for a minute. Um, I'm curious, then, what you make of this nonsense. Um, what strikes you in this crazy making? Um, where are you? Hi. Um, before you showed the starlings, I was thinking, ah, oh, the starlings are, a, are something that begins to exemplify this kind of drone movement. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? There's a particularly good view to the southwest mm -hmm. from upper floors of this building. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you go to the corner where you take in the Unitarian Church um, Tower mm -hmm. and various other high points, mm -hmm. um, you'll see small versions of mm -hmm. the starlings you're doing here. But it allows you to watch individual starlings. Sure how they break up into groups, how they will suddenly go individual and mm -hmm. perch somewhere. Others will join, then they'll suddenly turn into a group and do this wonderful thing, mm -hmm. break up again. And so you're sitting there thinking, well, what is the principle of autonomy sure. involved with any one bird mm -hmm. in all of this? Mm -hmm. And when does, is, is, are, is there a rhythm to autonomy? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're autonomous and sometimes you aren't. Yeah. Sometimes there's nothing to do but to join. And then where does the impulse come from not to be part of that flock anymore and just take a rest? Yeah. Um, and it was complex. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it absolutely is. And, and yet um, these, are, um, these are animals that don't have a discernible personality exactly, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we're talking about a, a kind of um, intrinsic algorithm that potentially governs, at least to a certain extent, that behavior. Um, I wish I understood it better. But thank you, I'll have to go check out the view. Um, but the question is then that, that, that is our species claiming mm -hmm. by way of its um, self-observed principles of personality, yeah. um, principles of autonomy that are defended or, or deprecated mm -hmm. in various ways, and who's doing what mm -hmm. with them? I Who wants us to be smart? <coughs> Who wants us to be starlings? And where do they want us to go? Sure. Um, yeah, well, it, so part of the, um, an ongoing question that I'm going to sort of extrapolate from you just a little bit. Um, what, one of the opening que open questions in this research is indeed, how does our usage of technology affect our movement? Um, sort, of, sort of the inverse of what I've been asking for most of the day. It's like, how does our obsessive use of phones, for example, affect our posture or carpal tunnel or just how we navigate uh, our attention through our days? Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of wondered this principle of personality or of algorithm, like how actually the machines choreograph us. 
Um, other thoughts, comments, things you want to uh, talk about? Um, yeah, hi. Well, just a comment on that. Because, uh, so has there been any research to find out whether we are behaving more like starlings or less like starlings? Yeah, the question is... It, it, just, it just occurs to me that if, that if, uh, if, what's, if something like what is happening is that, is that uh, our, our behavior is being broken down into gestures that can then be mapped by sort of semi-autonomous structures, yeah. Then, then is the is the way that people behave with their cell phones more like how starlings behave in mm. flocks, or is it, or is it, or is it like what we used to do with books? Mm. Well, so, so maybe to extrapolate slightly, maybe there's a question as to like what, for example, beha uh, behaviorally is a match for uh, uh, our usage of certain technologies, like whether it's starlings or fish or yeah, exactly. bees or some other, uh, in this case, animal, but potentially not. Um, like what is uh, a kind of analogous system um, that describes our movement? Good question mark. Yeah. Good question. Hi, thanks so much, Sydney. It's really fascinating. Uh, it, it feels so contemporary, and it feels so much conditioned by changes in technology over the last twenty years. And at the same time, it also feels very um, late nineteenth century in some sure. ways, right? It mm. feels like the convergence again of sociological studies. Mm -hmm. And my bridge using photography, right, to reveal something that's imperceptible to the naked eye. And then studies of, uh, kind of trans historical studies of gesture, like Abhi Babur, right, and trying to put together um, compendia, right, of, of um, gestures across history. But the way that early modern dance, you know, responds to that and grows out of it in some ways, it feels like, you know, rather than being necessarily something that resists choreography or in which choreography is necessary, is kind of ideologically enmeshed in problematic ways that the choreography <coughs> can precisely to respond to that sure. is a repetition of those earlier sure. resistant gestures right sure. yeah. and, and they are um, instrumental in, in this work right so something I, I didn't talk a whole lot about today is indeed how dance uh, the study of dance history um, and indeed of gesture of mime of dance notation uh, inform some of these conversations in both direct and indirect ways uh, well, one, one of my favorite um, so it's sort of an artificial uh, timeline, but um, Merce Cunningham's early motion studies with life forms, right? Um, uh, Merce Cunningham, uh, of course, is a choreographer um, whose uh, experiments with technology um, are very, uh, are, are vital to the field of contemporary dance. Um, and uh, over the last year or so, uh, on Instagram in particular, there has been a, a rising tide of, of uh, they're not dance nerds exactly, but they are people who take um, the success of uh, like, like later generations of the Lifeform software and make crazy dances out of them for performance exclusively on YouTube uh, or on Instagram. Um, and, and so there's a kind of, uh, of, a, of a history here um, that starts in it would have been the early to mid 90s um, with the advent of Lifeforms and other kinds of motion oriented software um, that results in these incredible performances of impossible choreographies on the internet. Um, and, and so I, I take your point, I mean, I, I guess part of my ongoing question then is, is where is the history, or like which history are we looking at, and, and how then uh, can we uh, learn from that, given that, um, I don't know, I wasn't taught how to read Minority Report in dance history, so, <laughs> you know. um, thank you. Um, yeah. So actually, yeah, I, I, mean, I did have a question to ask, or, or to uh, put forward something that you might comment on, yeah. which is the, you know, you've got minor minority port where gestures don't work, mm -hmm. but but in the world of inter interfaces now we have gestures that absolutely work, sure. and that everybody has learned. Mm -hmm. So that you take out your phone, you sure. tap, pinch you to swipe, zoom. you yeah. pinch, sure. you, and you learn all these things as as command mm -hmm. structures. I mean, they are a choreography, mm -hmm. but they work, and they're part of a, sort of a, an actual interface. Sure. So there's there's that on one end, and then there's so presumably. You know, pressing a button on a, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You still do it. Sure. It should work. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's uh, the voice interfaces now. So it's the, it's this it's this business of sort of command gestures that we were taught mm -hmm. to learn to do correctly. Yeah. And then there's a whole the whole world of gesture. Mm -hmm. And then there's gestures that are commensurate with language. Mm -hmm. the, so I wonder, you know. So the, the, the choreographic gestures that you're talking about are like in this in-between space. Mm -hmm. and do you see that as being taken over? And what's it being mm -hmm. taken over by command and control or yeah. by language? Sure. Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, so 
I'm thinking about gesture as you're sort of alluding in the most inclusive way. So I'm thinking about, uh, for example, I think a lot about microfacial expressions um, and how um, through software, um, for example, Affectiva is maybe one of the most sort of famous examples of, of a kind of software, a company that creates software that monitors uh, facial expressions for sentiment. Um, and so I'm counting facial expressions as a kind of gesture, uh, potential gestural control um, in that it affects which advertising, uh, what marketing, what advertising I see and where. Um, uh, I, similarly, uh, the uh, facial flush, um, like these very tiny, um, like I'm calling them gestures mostly out of convenience because I'm not quite sure how else to group them um, outside of a kind of um, biometrics. Um, so I, I guess I, from a choreographic vantage point, and this goes back to my sort of er, 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 uh, earlier question about like, well, what is a choreography now? Um, I'm including the Tom Cruise in this crazy making along, alongside my sweat as a gesture. And to answer your question, I am also sweating. Yes. So from the point of view both of surveillance and human machine interaction, um, a lot of people talk about trust. Mm -hmm. And they also talk about transparency. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that there's this difficult relationship between trust and transparency, sure. and they may be mutually self-destructive. Sure. For a choreo how do choreographers think of transparency and trust? What is it part of the vocabulary? I know trust is, mm -hmm. but is transparency part of the vocabulary of choreographers, and how? How did or it just isn't fit? That is fascinating. Um, trust and transparency to a choreographer, or in the dance like workplace, maybe. Or in you can say anything, and I won't know the difference. Okay, <laughs> great. That, that is my favorite kind of question. Um, well, so I guess to keep it kind of contemporary, um, this, this week uh, it, in the New York Times, it was announced that um, the School of American Ballet and the New York City Ballet are investigating their artistic uh, and uh, their, their chairman, Peter Martins, uh, for sexual misconduct. Um, and uh, from the standpoint of a contemporary institution um, grappling with um, uh, uh, abusive men, this is uh, kind of astonishing. Um, but given the history of ballet um, and of Western dance, it's inevitable. Um, which is to say that questions of, of trust and transparency um, in, in dance, and in particular in ballet, um, are always, um, at least to my mind, uh, they, they breathe with inequity. Um, and there are hierarchies everywhere, most of them violent and sexualized. Um, so trust and transparency, like in my own process, um, I, I deal uh, exhaustively with questions of trust and transparency in so much as I want desperately for uh, my dancers to, as they say, trust the process. Um, and I am maybe uh, overly transparent in terms of what I am thinking and seeking to accomplish in any given rehearsal. Um, but I can't say that those values are necessarily widely shared in the dance field. Let me just push you Please. a little bit. Yeah. So, when you when some in the choreography, yeah, is there a notion of making a motion or a gesture or a, a series of motions more transparent or less transparent, or sure. is it just not the way you talk? When you say transparent, do you mean like sort of visible or? Well, I don't know. So that's so. I guess the answer to your question is that it isn't. Okay. Uh, but certainly there is this notion of trust between dancers in the way one might pick up and say you need to trust more or less. Sure. That, you know. Yeah, you know, uh, in the absence of that trust, we, you tend to find dancers who are more frequently injured right. um, or whose career life cycles are shorter. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more quick thoughts. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you very much. It's all very interesting. But I'm especially interested in the last piece about the birds, the starlings, because then you've gone to this mass of people, yeah. or, or, or beings, um, and they're sort of self choreographed um, One of my thoughts as I was thinking of, about that was, what are they doing? Yeah. Are they coming together? Are they looking for a way to hang out tonight? Or what is <laughs> like, it that they're doing? Where the good starling clubs are. <laughs> and then I started thinking about, well, it's kind of like Penn Station when they announced sure. A train has arrived, and you can all go, and everybody, you know, if you watch from above, you see this flow of people. And that sort of thing about all the mass movements of people yeah. uh, nowadays, especially with refugees, fleeing hurricanes, all of those things. Do you 
see that as a kind of choreography, self-choreography? Do you think of those big movements of people that if you moved back enough, you could see kind of a pattern? Sure. Yeah, so this is kind of an age-old question in, in a way. Uh, does the choreography originate from the bodies being that are performing or from the larger structures, the superstructures around the moving bodies, right? So for example, in the case of, of Penn Station, like Penn Station is an ugly and oppressive building that causes me to move in particular ways. Um, am I choreographing my movements or is Penn Station choreographing my movements? Um, in the case of the Starlings, uh, you're right, like, I, we're not really sure like, what it is they're doing or seeking to accomplish, or maybe by extension, like, what are the parameters around which they move? Um, what's, uh, are they looking for the good Starling clubs, or are they just flying because it's fun, or we, like, we, don't, we don't know? Um, I, I guess my objective is to, even while not answering your question exactly, to ex explore the tensions between uh, having choreographic agency and being choreographed upon. Um, it strikes me that uh, we are increasingly being choreographed upon in ways that do not take our, our best wishes at heart. Uh, yes? To follow up on that, my response to your whole talk is that the choreographer is perhaps analogous to a programmer. Sure. And that you perhaps could be a hacker. Sure. <laughs> And what is your role as a hacker sure. with regard to dance yep. and movement and choreography? Yep. And is it possible to hack the larger oppressive system that we're all living under sure. using your talents as a choreographer and dancer sure. within that context? Um, I have two questions. Are you with the CIA and are you trying to recruit me? <laughs> um, Neither. Neither, great, okay, fine. Fine. <laughs> fine. Um, but I, 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 I take your question to heart, right? So this is um, one of the reasons why, for example, this, this drone project is so terrifying and interest, interesting to me is because um, ha after many years of me being like, you're sponsored by a state apparatus and like, you suck, you get money from DARPA or whatever. Like, it's really easy for me as an idle commentator um, to not truck with the actual ethical slipperiness of this technology. Um, and, and one of the reasons why I'm structuring this particular project in the way that I am is because I want to feel what it's like to get money from DARPA. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and I will be the first uh, person in performance studies, I assume, to have done so. At, at when this, uh, has there been performance studies people at Brown who've done oh. that money from Brown? That's right. <laughs> um, my, my, my point is that, it, at least in this case, this is a kind of ethical dilemma that I'm very interested in addressing through my work. Um, I don't honestly know how to choreo hack something um, of this kind of magnitude, other than I know that, for example, um, there are lots of people on the internet who uh, have little choreographies for fun that could be seen as a kind of gesture against uh, oppressive systems. One, 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 of my, one of my favorite examples of this, um, not having to do with oppression per se, but it is still kind of uh, inane and hilarious. Um, you guys heard of, uh, ever heard of um, people who use GPS tracking devices to draw penises? Mm -hmm. So th this, is, um, this is something that was uh, originally kind of a, a small, um, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, th th this was something that was originally kind of a, a small kind of culty um, Fitbit kind of community thing that then turned into a larger, sometimes commercialized uh, thing. My favorite example of this is um, actually a, a testicular cancer awareness event in New Zealand called Balls Out, where you would try and draw, use a GPS device to draw the biggest penis you could on Google Maps. Um, but this, this is another way of, uh, this is not just me talking about penises, though that is literally what I'm doing. Um, this is also a way of using, again, movement data um, for expressive means. Um, and whether that's sort of hacking, not, not really, but it is expressive in, in ways that are maybe um, sort of aggressive or assertive in ways that we haven't seen before. Um, I think we've, the uh, last comment, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I had two points on your, uh, your video here. One, remember, uh, I saw the Minority Report, and it also features three psychics. Yes. For premonition. The and original black box. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the other point I wanted to make was, uh, in this your video of Starlings here, at some point we get in very close, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if, if the, the flock was flying toward the camera or if the camera just used zoom lens, but it confirms something that I thought about and that to look at, uh, many of the Starlings are not flying in the, in the same direction. Mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of chaos still there. Yeah. If you get close enough. Sure. Um, but like with all chaos, is the chaos is still governed by principles that we maybe don't understand. Um, so, so this this is the the algorithmic question. Like this is why I'm trying to figure talk with the biomimicry nurse to figure out like to the extent that we can, like what are the parameters there, and what does it mean um, as um, you were gesturing towards at the very beginning, like what, what, what does it mean to be part of and yet absent a group? Um, these are also, this is early modern dance, right? Like this is um, a major dance historical thread, um, but with birds. Um, I think that's all the time we have. Please join me in. Oh, thank you.